Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alamin. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursalin. Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Tasliman kathiran kathira. Fama badu. Qala nabiyuna Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Innamal amalu bin niyat. Aw kama qala alaihi salatu wa salam. Rahu rawahu fi Bukhari wa Muslim. My brothers and sisters, Rasulullah in this famous hadith which is narrated by Umar ibn al-Khattab and which is the first hadith in Bukhari and Muslim is where he said وسلم, that the value of a deed, the basis of a deed, the reward of a deed is based on its intention. Now, I want you to, to think about this very carefully and to keep this in mind because today one of the biggest problems that we have with respect to Muslims learning about Islam and practicing Islam is their attitude towards Islam. Before I go there, let me tell you something which uh, I learned from one of my friends who is a airline pilot. I have many friends who are pilots and uh, I love flying. I, uh, I don't have a license but uh, I have flown in, in small planes, big planes, all kinds of planes. One of the, this person said to me, I asked him once, I said, what do you do if your plane is crashing? So you are flying at whatever attitude, say, you know, 20,000 feet or 25,000 feet and your plane goes into a tailspin, uh, you are headed downwards. What is it that you do? This friend said to me, what we are taught is, go back to the manual. Go back to the manual. So I said, you mean you actually pull out a manual and start reading in the cockpit when you are facing downward? He said, no. He said, the first thing in the manual is, check your instruments. So before you start to fly, right? When you are on the ground, before you take off, you do as a pilot, you do an instrument check. And there's a sequence that you have to follow. You go from one end of the cockpit to the other, all the entire instrument panel, you check everything. You check off, check off, check off, check off. Finally, you give the thumbs up sign to say, Everything is functioning, all systems going, ready to start, and then the uh, engines are, uh, and, and then you are given the uh, permission to start taxiing to take off. So he said, when you are in a tailspin and almost 100% you're going to crash, what do you do? You go back to the basics. You go back to your instrument check and see what is happening now on this instrument panel. What is this thing telling me about me and my situation, about this plane, about what is likely to happen and not happen? What is this instrument check? What is it that this thing is now telling me? That is the meaning of going back to the basics. Now, why am I saying that? I'm saying that because today we seem to be in a situation in Islam as Muslims, as, as, as people who are uh, of the Muslim faith all over the world, is that thanks to a number of reasons, I can, I can talk about uh, my uh, assessment for the reasons why we are in this place, but I'm not going to do that. I don't want to take your time on that. But take my word for it, for a number of reasons. Uh, Muslims are in a state, are in a kind of siege mentality. They, are, they, are, they feel threatened from everywhere, um, ideologically speaking. Of course, in many cases also, uh, Muslims all over the world are physically threatened. Muslims all over the world are, there's a wholesale slaughter of Muslims happening. Uh, nobody likes to talk about that. Nobody mentions that. It doesn't show up on headlines anywhere. But uh, take Yemen, take Syria, uh, take uh, in Egypt what is happening, uh, take what the what is happening to the Uyghurs in China, take what's happening to the Myanmar Muslims in in uh, to, to the Rohingya Muslims in Myanmar um, and many other places. I mean, I, I, I'm not making an exhaustive list of this, but many, many other places 
Muslims are on the hit list. It is open season and uh, nobody bothers. I mean, you can, anybody can kill a Muslim. Uh, you can wipe out entire villages uh, and no questions asked. Now, because of that, even Muslims like us who are sitting in comfort and in safety uh, in lands where Muslims are not threatened, uh, where Muslims have, uh, have rights and they have privileges and and they have uh, position, they have some level of authority, they have wealth, even they are, they feel threatened. They feel as if, you know, something is going to happen and, um, and, and, and what will happen to me. Now, because of that, there is a strange attitude towards Islam. And that attitude for a lot of people, and believe me, I, I am speaking now generally, so obviously like all generalizations, it will not apply to everybody. So if you are one of those who, have, when you are listening to me, if you feel that this doesn't apply to me, I am very happy for you. Alhamdulillah, may Allah give you all power. May Allah protect you. May Allah keep you there and keep you protected. So make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for steadfastness. Make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to thank him for keeping you in that place where you are not like what I'm saying. But if not, here is my problem definition and also inshallah a solution. And the problem definition is that we People like this, we are feeling threatened. And so therefore, we start seeing Islam as a burden. We start seeing Islam as a, a musibah. You know, this is like, I've been inflicted with this. What do I do? I mean, I was born as a Muslim. I've got a Muslim name. I've got a Muslim face. Um, I, I, you know, my, my parents and my ancestors, everybody is Muslim. And now this is a liability. This is a problem. Right? I'm... Believe me, I mean, none of us is actually saying this in so many words. But if you look at our actions, if you put a, if you put a, you know, a candid camera, a video, and start videotaping us and our lives, uh, believe me, a lot of the stuff which I'm telling you, you, you will, you will see on that video. And if you then sit and interpret that video and said, okay, here is this man or here is this woman who's behaving like this, uh, why are they doing that? This is the conclusion you will come to. That they feel burdened. They feel that this is a a problem, this is a musibat. Um, as I said, you will not say it in so many words, but the thought in the mind is, I wish I was not Muslim. Then I would be free of this. Now stay with that thought for a second. Um, as I'm talking to you today, just yesterday, I heard, I learned about the passing away of one of my closest, dearest friends who have been friends with me, we've been friends for over 35 years. Very nice human being, very good person. And uh, I loved him very much like a brother. And he loved me very much like a brother. And he was, I mean, I was like a mentor to him. And Alhamdulillah, I, he spent a lot of time in my company, including in masajid, including listening to uh, lectures and bayans and everything else. And, uh, and yesterday he had a massive heart attack and he died. And when I got this information, when I got this news, of course, I was absolutely devastated. I wept. And then I thought to myself, I do not know what state he died in. I'm only hoping that he died having accepted Islam. But I don't know that. And as far as the world is concerned, he died on his religion, um, which was not Islam. Now, that is when it hit me for the nth time the value of these two small statements. And what are those two small statements? What are these two small statements? La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. There is nobody worthy of worship except Allah. And that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam is the messenger of Allah and the last and final one after whom there is no messenger. And so I say, Ashadu la ilaha illallah. I bear witness to this, that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah. Wa ashadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. And I bear witness to this, that there is that the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa is Muhammad Mustafa, sallallahu alayhi wa And that he is the last and final messenger after whom there is no messenger. What struck me was the value of of this, this one statement or this, this pair of statements is the difference between Jannah and the other place. 
And no matter what you may have done or not done. If you die without this statement in your heart, believing it and living by it, then that is not a death that I would wish on anybody. So the whole attitude of treating Islam as a burden, I would say that anytime you're feeling that this having to pray five times a day, that this dress code, that these restrictions on what to eat and what not to eat, that these restrictions on behavior, anytime, and I can add to this list, but I won't. You, you, know, you know the list. Anytime you feel that this is a burden, I want you to do this exercise. I want you to leave everything, sit quietly, and imagine your death. Imagine that you have died. Whatever the reason. Don't get into the... Into the the data of it, you know, was, was it a heart attack, was it this, whatever it was, you are dead. And your body is lying there. You are lying there. Nobody says you are lying there, your body is lying there. So you are lying there. Picture that. Close your eyes if you like. Picture that. Lie down there. Picture that. And then say that at that time, you died without Islam. You died thinking and believing that Islam was a burden. You lived all your life thinking and feeling that Islam was a burden. So you tried to do the minimum. You tried to do the least. And then you died. And then what opens before you? What opens before you is what is called reality. And that reality will tell you the actual wasn't, the actual weight, the actual worth, the actual meaning of La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. That is what I want you to think about. And so when you approach this deen, approach it keeping your eyes wide open and your heart wide open. And remembering that none of this stuff in the world, not your oppression, not your freedom, not your health, not your sickness, not your wealth, not your poverty, not your need, not the fulfillment of that need, not your desire, not the curtailment of that desire. Nothing matters. On the day when you are lying there on that slab, dead, none of that will have any significance, will have any value whatsoever. Zero. Whether when you are lying on that, on that slab, whether you owned a Bugatti or you owned a Mercedes or you owned a bicycle will not make a whit of a difference. When you are lying on that slab, whether you had a wife and children, whether you had none, will make no difference. When you are lying on that slab, whether you had money or you were a beggar on the street will make no difference. The only thing which will make a difference, and that difference is a difference which will be forever. The only thing which will make that difference is whether you died with La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah or not. Nothing else. And today you got that for free. And that is your problem. You got it for free so you have no value for it. As I told you, those to whom this does not apply, please feel free. Alhamdulillah, good for you. But those who it applies to, listen very carefully. As I told you, candid camera. It's not a matter of, I'm saying this has value. No, no. What does my life show? What does the candid camera picture look like? Does it look like somebody who has value or does it look like somebody who has no value? 
That is the question. My brothers and sisters, we have a situation where people, Muslims, are even studying Islam. They are, they are reading, they are searching the internet, not because they want knowledge to improve their understanding of the Quran and the Sunnah, not because they want to discover better and more powerful ways of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but because they are searching for loopholes. They are searching for loopholes. I want to see what is the least I can do and get away with it. Believe it or not, one genius sends me a question and says that I read, and he sent me the link also. I read in such and such a place in the, on the internet that reading Durud Ibrahim after Tashahud is not fard. So I decided not to do it. Now two years have passed and I don't know Allah Alam Allah gave him tawfiq so alhamdulillah this is his good fortune. So he asked, he's asking me a question and saying is my salah valid? Has my salah been valid for these two years and I just finished praying Maghrib or whatever it was and I did not deliberately I mean imagine not forgetting deliberately I did not read Durud Ibrahim because hey, it's only a sunnah. It's only a sunnah. Please notice my, my gesture by face. It's only a sunnah. Sunnah teach hai na. Faras to nahi hai na. It's not a fard. Rukun to nahi hai na. It's not a rukun. It's not a pillar of the salah. So I didn't do it. In wudu, I read what are the faraid of wudu. So that is how I would do wudu. Not because there is very little water. <clears throat> so maybe if I leave out the sunan of wudu and I just do the faraid to make sure that I have proper wudu given that I have a limited amount of water. Not for all that reason. Deliberately. The rest of it is only a sunnah. Is my salah valid? What is the answer? What is the answer? So in this searching on the internet, this person who is searching on the internet, what is he looking for? Is he looking for better and more ways of pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or is he looking at what is the minimum I can do? Now, if that is the case, if he's looking for, because I mean, I don't want to put, my, put myself in his heart and talk about him, but I'm just saying, that the action shows the intention. Is the, if the action was to still read Durood because I love Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then no problem. Alhamdulillah, you found out one of the uh, details about Salah. Alhamdulillah. If you ask, for example, somebody who knows, please narrate for me what are the arkan of Salah. What are the faraid? What are the sunan? What are the mustahabat? And the person lists everything down for you correctly. Alhamdulillah, this is very good. So he knows what is far. He knows, he knows what is not far. But then you ask him, how do you pray? What is he going to tell you? Huh? If you go, for example, if you went to Abu Bakr as Siddiq If you went to Abdullah ibn Abbas If you went to Abdullah ibn Umar If you went to Imam, Imam al-Shafa, Imam, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik bin Anas, Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, Rahimahullah ta'ala. If you went to Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani, Rahimahullah ta'ala. If you went to Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Al-Qayyum, Al-Jawziyah, if you went to Sheikh Abul Hassan Ali Nadwi Rahmatullahi, if you went to Hussein Abad Madani Rahmatullahi, if you went to Sheikh Bin Baz Rahmatullahi, if you went to Sheikh Albani Rahmatullahi, Nasiruddin Albani Rahmatullahi, make your own list. <coughs> right? Make your own list. If you go to all of these people, all of the shuk, 
And you ask them this question, please tell me the list of arkan, of faraid, of sunan, of mustahabat, of salat. Believe me, they will all give you the list. I don't know if the Sahaba would have done it because in, in their time there was no, there was no, uh, you know, uh, mustahab and, and, uh, and, and the rest of the uh, things in, uh, in, 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 uh, in fiqh. Abu Bakr Siddiq would have, would have simply told you, don't waste my time. I pray the way Rasulullah prayed because he said, Sallu kamara aytumuni usalli. Abu Kamar Khala alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, pray as you have seen me pray, I pray as I saw him pray. But the others later on, because we have the fiqh, so they would have told you. Then you ask them another question. And you ask Shaykh Abul Hassan Ali Nadwi Rahmatullahi. You ask Shaykh Bin Bad Rahmatullahi. You ask Shaykh Abdul Qadir Jilani Rahmatullahi. You say, Shaykh, may Allah bless you, Jazakumullah Khairan, for giving me this list of things. But tell me, how do you pray? When you pray, can I watch you? And please, you know, recite everything loudly so I can record you. And let me see whether you recite Durood in Tashahud. Because you just told me it is not Fard. Let me see whether you recite the Tasbihat in Ruku and Sujood. Because you just told me it's not, it's not a Rukun. Let me see if you do that. Let me see if you recite anything after Surah Al-Fatiha. Because the second Surah or whatever part of the Quran you recite after Surah Al-Fatiha is not a Rukun. So let me see if you do that or not. Let me, let me. Now, what will you find? What do you think you will find? Learning something. And that's why I began with the hadith of intention. Learning something, we need to ask, why am I learning? What is the purpose of my learning? Do I want this knowledge to be a witness for me on the day of judgment? Or do I want this knowledge to be the means by which I will be thrown into the hellfire? Because this knowledge will prove that my intention was shaitani. I was not following the Hanafi fiqh. I was not following Shafi fiqh. I was not following Maliki fiqh. I was not following Hanbali fiqh. I was, I was following shaitani fiqh. Because shaitan came into my mind and told me that whatever Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did, which is Sunnah, is only a Sunnah. Then for your good, for your great information, let me tell you, the whole Salah is only a Sunnah. The whole Quran al Karim is only Hadith. Because where did you hear the Quran from? Where did you, Muslim, from the first of them to the last of them, where did you hear the Quran from? Did Allah speak to you? Did Jibreel come to you? Or did you hear it by Sauti Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam? Literally? Or by implication? So what is the definition of hadith? Whatever Rasulullah sallallahu said, Whatever he did and whatever he allowed. Whatever he said, whatever he spoke, what is Quran? Quran is Kalamullah Bisauti Muhammad Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi wa Sahabi wa Sallam. It is the Kalam of Allah. I don't say it is the Kalam of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. No, it is not. It is the kalam of Allah. But where did you get it from? You got it from the tongue and in the beautiful voice of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say in this kalam? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Inna Allah wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Allah said, verily and truly and surely, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla jalaluhu himself and the malaika, they send blessings on Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam 
those who believe oh you who believe ya ayyuhalladhina amanu what is the meaning of that address in the quran it means it is an address of hukm it is an order an instruction being given by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to those who believe if you want to if you want to refuse that instruction then you are saying by your action bil amal you are saying i am not among those who believe because the instruction you gave is for those who believe i refuse to follow the instruction so i am not from those who believe your instruction does not apply to me allah said ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi you also send make dua that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala should bless him allahumma salli ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala ali muhammad كما صليت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى ال محمد كما باركت على ابراهيم وعلى ال ابراهيم انك حميد مجيد please understand you don't want to send salat and salam on rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam please don't he doesn't need it because allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send salam on him what is your salam worth We send salat and salam on him because we need it. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "The one who sends salat and salam on me, Allah sends salam on that person ten times for every one time." He told us, "Do not be bakhil." He said, "Do not be a person who is stingy in sending salat and salam on me." the hadith that we have heard million times almost every single ramadan bayan in every country in the world will have this hadith rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam ascended the mimbar when he stood on the first step he said amin then he went on the second step he said amin when he went on the third step step he said amin the sahaba rizwanullah alayhi majmain they asked him when he had finished his salah when he had finished his khutbah they said ya rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam You did something today which you had never done before, so please tell us and 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 you know guide us. You said, "I mean, three times." Why? Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "When I stood on the first step of the of the uh, mimbar, Jibril alayhi salam came to me and he said, 'Ya Rasulullah, for the one who gets Ramadan and does not manage to get the forgiveness of Allah.'" meaning he gets ramadan but he regrets he he neglects ramadan maybe he doesn't fast he doesn't pray he doesn't give sadaqat he does not do anything in ramadan ramadan is like any other month which comes and goes so someone who gets ramadan and is not able to get the forgiveness of allah subhanahu wa taala allah subhanahu wa taala has cursed him has cast him far away say amin and nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam said i said amin Then he said on the second step, he said, "O oh, Ya Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if somebody finds their parents and they are in the presence of their parents and Allah has given them elderly parents, one or both of them, and this person does not serve them and does not get their du'a and does not and does not help them and is not kind to them, then Allah has cursed him and cast him far away. Say Amin." Then we shall Rasulullah said. said i said amin and on the third step jibril alaihi salam said ya rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam if your name comes i'm not talking about tashahhud in durud in tashahhud just the name muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam just the name the title rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam jibril alaihi salam said ya rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam if your name comes before some before muslims if they hear your name and they do not send salat and salam on you allah has cursed them and cast them far away you say amin nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam said i said amin now you tell me an action which if you do it one time it gets you 10 salam and salawat and and blessings from allah and if you deliberately leave it and refuse to do it then allah has cursed you and cast you far away you what you what do you want to do with that action what is your value for that action this is the value of durud this is the value of sending salat and salam on muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam as i told you everything begins with the attitude you are studying islam for what 
Are you studying Islam for the deen to have, to be your shafi, to be your intercessor with Allah for Jannah or Jahannam? Because the religion will do both. That is why. The amal. I'm studying Islam. Is it good for me or not? I don't know. Depends on my niyyah. Depends on my niyyah. I'm studying Islam. And that is why Rasulullah said this. Rasulullah said, Do not study Islam for three reasons. One, to argue with the fuqaha. Two, to look good before the sufaha. To impress the fools and ignorant people. And three, to attract the eyes of people, meaning for popularity, for money, for, you know, Facebook likes. Huh? He didn't say Facebook likes. Do not study for these three reasons. Don't study to argue. Don't study to look good before fools. They don't know anything. So you look nice. You look good before. Oh, say, oh mashallah, mashallah. Oh, oh, oh baharul huh? And the third thing is, do not study the in in order to become popular, to attract the eyes of people, to make money out of Islam. My brothers and sisters, seriously, think about this. Islam is the biggest, absolutely the number one wealth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have given us and He gave it to us without asking he gave it to us because of his rahmah. He gave it to us as a blessing. He gave it to us free of cost. And may Allah forgive us. That's the reason why we have no value for it. We think salah is a burden. Whereas salah is the biggest benefit. It is the biggest asset. It is the biggest strength. It is the weapon. It is the power. It is. I, I don't have words to, to try to explain to you the value of salah. And you think it's a burden. You want to make shortcuts out of it. And you want to shorten your salah by not reciting durood. I mean, how misguided is that? Really, subhanAllah al-Azim. SubhanAllah al How shaitan plays games with the minds of people. Make istighfar, make tawbah. Make istighfar, make tawbah. Ask yourself, why am I studying Islam? Correct that niya. Correct that niya before you reach a stage where that knowledge becomes a problem for you. It is already a problem, but meaning you will see the results of that problem. And that is when the last breath is out. Study Islam out of love. Study Islam out of shauk. Out of this great enthusiasm. You know, when I was uh, in my youth, when I was in school and college, I used to ride every single day. I, I, I still love horses. I still love riding, but I don't get an opportunity here too much or at all. But in those days, every single day, I loved riding. In those days, the within quotes worst day for me was Monday because Monday the riding club was closed. That was their weekly holiday. Every single day I would wake up at the crack of dawn. I would, you know, go all the way to the riding club. I used to cycle or I used to go on a, had a, a, a moped. I used to, I used to ride there. And then I would ride horses for two hours. And I would come back home every single day of my life. <clears throat> I lived and I, for me, the best and most beautiful perfume was what the stable smelled like. Because I would go and I would groom the horse and I would clean out the, muck out the stables. And then I would saddle the horse and I would ride and I would then take the saddle off and I'd groom the horse back again and take it to the water, drink and then ride another, another, another horse. I mean, this, this, this was... Every single day, this was my routine. And I loved it. Nobody was paying me for it. I mean, I was actually paying because I was paying a fee. In those days, it was, it was, you know, very little money. But in those days, that very little money went, was, was, you know, 
Today, if I say I was paying two rupees, you might say, well, you know, what is that? That doesn't even buy you a cup of tea. True. In those days, two rupees bought you eight cups of tea. So it had value. The point I'm making here is not about horse racing. I'm saying the point I'm saying here is that if you have shauk, if you love something, if you really want to do something, then doing it is a pleasure. If you take the amount of effort it made, I mean, in those days, one liter of petrol costs less than one rupee, Indian rupee. I, I remember the day petrol plus 2 tea oil, you know, they used to put this oil in the, in the petrol itself, in the tank, the lubricant uh, in, in, the, in that motor moped. The day I paid a full rupee, I mean, I paid him one rupee and he didn't give me any, any change back. I thought to myself, my God, I mean, this world is coming to an end. I mean, how expensive things have become. So there I was, a kid in, in senior school, I had no, obviously no income or anything. My, my parents were kind enough to give me that uh, money for my horse riding. So I was spending money. I was spending a lot of time, obviously a lot of energy. No one had to wake me up. No one had to ever. And I didn't miss it one single day and never overslept. Because it was this love for horse riding which kept me, which ensured that I woke up on time and rain, moon or sunshine, I went. I loved it. And today, 40, 50 years later, I still think of those days with great nostalgia, with, with you know, literally, I mean, my mouth waters. The question I'm asking you is, what is your orientation towards Allah? What is your orientation towards Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? What is your orientation towards Islam? Is it like what I'm describing to you? Is it that you, this is, this is where you are, this is where you want to be, this is what I want, I've got it, Alhamdulillah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Ya Allah, Alhamdulillah, 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 Rabbi Laka, Alhamdulillah, Kama Yam Baghi, Li Jalali, Wa Shika, Wa Li Yazim Suhaq, Wa Li Yazim Sultanik. All praise and glory to you, Ya Allah. Or is it to say, oh God, again, time to pray. Man, I wish, why did we have these five prayers? I mean, you know, why does Allah need five prayers? Which one? Please think about this. Please think about this. Because this is critically important. As I told you, this is the most important thing that you will ever hear from me or I will ever tell you. And that is, what is your attitude towards Islam? And as I told you, a day will come when that attitude and the implication of that attitude will become absolutely crystal clear. And that day will be the day when you are lying on a slab. And that day will come to every single one of us. Every single one of us. Nobody but nobody is exempt from that day. Or from that lying on that slab. I'm speaking figuratively. I mean, you might say, well, you know, what if I get vaporized in a, in a nuclear explosion or something? May Allah protect all of us from these things. But no matter what, no matter what, we will stand before Allah. And on that day, before anything else, this hadith will be the criterion based on which our amal will be judged. What was the intention of this person? When he or she did this action, what was their intention? Were they trying to escape obedience or were they being grateful slaves that they were seeking to obey more and more with more and more shock which one I ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala jalla to be pleased with you and never to be displeased I ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to enable us to be thankful to him and to really and really and really thank him for islam because there is no wealth better than that I ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be to help us to live this religion and to practice this religion with great joy and great pleasure. And we ask Allah to accept this from us 
and to wipe out our faults and to accept our actions in a way that suits His Majesty and Grace. And I, we ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to cover you with His mercy and His forgiveness. And we ask Allah Subhanahu wa Taala to grant you Jannah al Firdaus wa Lailatul Qaisa. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyil kareem wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Bi rahmatika ya rahman rahimin. Walhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wa sallamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.